What's going on? I'm Fred Kennedy. I'm the creator of Mud 79, a Star Wars audio drama, Platoon meets Star Wars, best way to describe it. Also, I've got a comic book out with the image right now called Dead Romans, which is a love story set during one of the bloodiest massacres in the history of the Roman Empire. Juxtaposition. It's fantastic. You can find me on social media at fearless underscore Fred on both Twitter and Instagram. I'm on Blue Sky at Fred Kennedy. And you are watching and or listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a returning guest. It has been three years since he was last on the show. He's a very busy individual. You know him, of course, from Q107 in Toronto, as well as his amazing comic book works that we've had him on past comic convention interviews as well, too. We're here today talking about Mud 79. It's actually a continuation from three years ago, which is amazing to hear. Joined by the ever-talented Fred Kennedy. How are you doing today? Fantastic, man. Good to be here. <laughs> Good to have you back on. It's been far, far, too, far too long. You've been blowing up on social media, not only for your work in radio, but also in comics. And of course, season two of Mud 79, which you're currently in the works on as yeah. well, too. I jump ahead of myself, as I normally do with these types of interviews, because I'm so excited to get you on and talking about this stuff. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. Well, I've got a book out with Image right now called Dead Romans. We're still discussing with Image about the second arc of that book. Uh, issue five uh, comes out in July and issue six will be out in the at the end of August. And I've got my radio program. I've also got a book with Blizzard Entertainment that is coming out sometime next year that I can't talk about at all. Uh, but I can say it's very cool and I'm really excited to do it. And I've got Mud 79, my Star Wars radio play, which is sort of like uh, Platoon meets Star Wars. And that is currently on its sixth episode, which is like a re-release of mm -hmm. the first season because I re-recorded the dialogue. I never liked the VO on it and I never liked a lot of the aspects of the production because by the time I had done it and finished it, I had learned so much. I was really learning as I went. So I went back after it was all done and I re-recorded the season and then I remixed it all too. And wow. I didn't retcon anything. I didn't change anything. I just cleaned it up and improved the sound effects and the VO. Cause I thought the first reading sounded too sad and depressing i was when i did the read originally i was going for scoop mcnary's vo mm -hmm. in narcos mexico i don't know if you've ever seen narcos mexico yeah. but it opens with this incredible you could say it's an info dump if anything but it's not it does so much it gives you the setup of the show it gives you a breakdown about what is happening with the characters what the stakes are and scoop mcnary's read is just incredible mm -hmm. But the thing about that read is that it works well when there's a visual component with it. But when it's on its own, it's very dry. And also, I don't have Scoop McNary's voice. His <laughs> voice is so good. So, you know. We could all wish we had someone else's voice. <laughs> yeah. Sure. His, vo his read is so good. It's yeah. so great. I was surprised that you were re-releasing season one because when I started listening to it again before our interview here, I was like, this sounds really familiar to me. Like, I, I remember the cadence i remember the setup of the actual season one and i was going through the episodes and i'm like i really enjoy it but i enjoyed it so much more this time around for the the three or four episodes i got into it so <laughs> so obviously you've done a great job with it but that must have been a really hard decision for you to actually go through and recreate all virtually everything because that's it, wow yes yeah the thing about uh the way i produced it is i saved all my my multi-tracks and my mix downs and i saved everything yeah. So remixing it was really just a question of going through the master audio track and then dropping in the new read and finding the cut points and then having it in the raw and then adding to it. And so there's a lot of parts where I, I had music in it and I'm like, you know what? I didn't understand how to properly use music and I've got a deeper library now. So I add this music in. So it adds to it. And, and I've got a great producer and I call her the contemptible harpy in the credits all the time. Dila Velasquez. She's my 
producer who like an editor for the script and she's got a really good ear she's got a great ear and she's been very helpful in helping me make it better having her on board there was things that she was giving me as feedback in the beginning that i don't think i was necessarily picking up on but by the end we're very much you know cycling through we know exactly what we're doing with the scripts and how to properly put them together and the big plot points and all that stuff too so you're planning through Season two, season three as well. Uh, you know, you, we were yeah. briefly talking about this briefly. So what's the game plan of the actual series itself from where we currently are with as of this recording to the future plans of the series itself? Because I almost like a, a, like a roadmap to the series is kind of what I'm looking for. I'm a big fan of the three act format. I like just three acts. The first season you're getting the sense of this world. You're getting the sense of the stakes of this character and the people that he's friends with and the friends that he loses along the way because it's a very dangerous place and you really start to understand he was very excited at the beginning of the story. He's very excited to be there. He's very excited to be part of the Imperial Armory and, and he was proud of it, you know? By the end of it, by the end of the first season, he realizes that the Empire can bleed. Now, this isn't the empire that exists in like Andor. To put it in perspective for anyone who hasn't heard it, this is five years after the end of the Clone Wars. So the empire itself is still, for a good majority of the empire, they don't even see it as the empire. They see it as a new and improved republic. That is the way, they, that, and I've made it very clear that that's the sense of what the characters feel. That's how they feel at the beginning of the story. Now we're in the second season. The main character, the narrator, who is the point of perspective for the whole story, the singular voice, it's a singular voice, the name is Solomon Kwai. At the end of the first season, he realizes that the empire can bleed. Now the question is, what happens now? Like I said, it's sort of built around the, the idea of platoon. And there was a point in the Vietnam War where they realized, if we're going to win, we've got to commit to winning. And so there are some changes in terms of the command structure that happen. And I've got some fantastic additions to the voice cast. Dominic Diamond, who hosted the Games Master on BBC, oh, yeah. is, a fan, is a fan of the show. Nice. And he plays this new character who becomes the new. And these are, I'm not giving away mid-season spoilers. <laughs> right? This is like the first episode or two that all this stuff starts happening, right? Yeah. He's this new Commodore. He's Commodore Panama Dean, who was like a big war hero during the Clone Wars. And he's known he gets things done. You send him places and he's got carte blanche. He is the Emperor's will. And when he shows up, it's just like in Rebels Season 2 when the Grand Inquisitor says you're about to see there's worse things than death. He is worse than death. You know, he is the fist that rolls in and he's going to break eggs and he is going to make things happen. And also, like you said, we talked like three years ago yeah. when we talked about this last, I, I talked a lot about the white coats in that and like Imperial intelligence who are now collectively always referred to as the ISD. And this is what's frustrating. And this is like a thing about fan projects is that I sort of laid all this canon out. Not that it's canon. I just laid out this world building, you know, yeah. and that was three years ago. And I just, a comic stuff was taking off and freelance writing was taking off and bills over blasters. Like if it's paying me, yeah. I'm going to do that. I worked so far ahead that I had extra time to do this, to get back into it. And what's frustrating is since that show has come out and I wrote the first four chapters of season two. So that is 13 episodes. I wrote the first 13 episodes before I had to take a break. And then I wrote the last seven episodes since then, like in the fall. And if you watch Andor, like that vibe, like that is mud. Like that is so mud. And I'm not being like, they were listening and they stole it. But I need everyone to know that I wasn't watching Andor and taking notes about, oh, that's good. I got to do that. No, all this stuff was established in the first season. Yeah. Imperial Intelligence Services, they always call them the White Coats. They call them the White Coats all the time. And then like a lot of the jargon and nicknames and things like that, I leaned on my dad for because my dad was a career military guy. And I worked on Army bases when I was in high school and in college. And the thing about Army and the military is there's always nicknames for everything. So MPs are always called meatheads. They're not called meatheads because you think they're dumb. I mean, that's the implication. But they're called meatheads because they wear a red beret. So they got meat on their head. So it's like a steak. 
that's the type of nicknames that military guys give everything. So intelligence workers, the ISB, would never get called the ISB. They just call them white coats because they only wear that white coat. And when they roll in, bad things happen. And they repeatedly talk about how, oh, man, you don't want them to even know your name. The second they're even talking about your bad things happen, not just to you, but to your family, bad things happen when the white coats are around. And now, because this theater of war on this faraway little planet is now popping off, and when you get to the end of the first season, you'll realize what's actually starting to happen. You don't even know, but you know it's bad. Like that's where that's all you know. Now Imperial Intelligence is there because were there leaks? Were there insiders? Were people getting bought off? I mean, you're out in the far reaches of Imperial space. Is there corruption? Is that what's happening? So the Empire, what made the Empire different than the Republic was that there was corruption but only on Coruscant. They didn't tolerate that type of behavior in other places because there are people in the inner circle that are very fond of the grapes and wine that come from this region as we established. And people think that that makes it sound very trite, but if you take a look at actual history, that's the type of things that a big imperial power will destroy a smaller country over. Well, they got good. They got good spices. Yeah, they have a decent bath over here too. You know, like yeah, I came, I came so, to like this hotel. You know, like yes, yeah, like <laughs> it sounds silly, but that's how things work. The story really gets progressive in terms of its darkness and its toll on the characters. And there's a series of five episodes where everything kind of dials back, and that is when you really get a sense of how far the characters have come as individuals, and it sets up the way the whole series ends everything that happens at the end of season three is mapped out in this series of five episodes which is episodes nine through 14 and my plan is to do a third season of the show and that will really wrap it up and that will give conclusion to solomon kwai's character i'm not saying that is he's gonna die and i'm not saying that that will conclude the theater of combat in Sestin Four, but Solomon Kwai's arc will conclude there. And my very st- selfish and dream boy idea is that if I was ever in a position to tell a real Star Wars story, I would tell a Star Wars story from his daughter's perspective, like 20 years after and I would sort of build on this setting and world that I have created, you know, it's its own little corner of the galaxy far, far away. Sounds like you're, you're already in the works of something like that. I have perhaps. it planned. Like it's always good to have it in your back pocket, <laughs> just in case I have plans. I know her gist. I know what she's doing. Here's why I don't even really want to give anything else away. Because if I throw it out now and the House of Mouse hears that it's some fan fiction I've already worked on, any chance of doing it's gone. So I'm just going to pretend that, oh, I got an idea. What do we do that? But the, you'll know, you'll know. Uh, (laughs) Wink, wink. wink. I, I really do like the path that the story is on. And I'm very proud of what I've done with Mud 79. And my only frustration is that you say that you did a Star Wars fan creation and people have this like immediate urge to be like, okay. <laughs> but when I listen to it and then I listen to other things of this nature that have been done, and I don't want to be like, I'm the best, but mine is completely unique. Like there is nothing else like this out there. And I think in the best possible way. Well, that's what I loved about the first time three years ago and then hearing the the same the episodes with their the tweaks and the the updates that you've given them is that the same energy that you put into the the initial season three years ago like i said sounds better now but the excitement and the energy is still there in each episode it's not like it's dragging it doesn't feel like you're going through a slog you're actively listening and following to these characters and and the and the main characters specifically at that so i love the fact that like listening to 
the sound effects in the background and hearing it over the dial or under the dialogue and things like that. The subtle nature of the audio, and we talked about this three years ago, but it still holds up today. Like you, you, Thank you. You've done such a great job with it that it shows your expertise as, as a radio personality and an audio engineer as well. So, you know, if the radio gig doesn't ever work out, you could always work <laughs> on like the, on the, on the film sets there as, as the guy was saying it, telling everyone to shut up. There's a guy, um, he's a Foley artist in, uh, Toronto. His name's, uh, it's audio studio, O D D I O studio. And he's a Foley artist who does every show you can imagine. Like all of the big shows, he's done, he's won Emmy awards, he's won Oscars, he's won Gemini's, he's won all these awards, and he messaged me to be like, "This is really well produced." And I was like, "Oh my god, <laughs> I lost my mind!" And I even there's some audio sound effects that he made for me just as a fan of the show <laughs> that I incorporated when I made the show because there's certain things that are weirdly specific that help bring things to life. There's a series on Netflix called High Score about video games, right? Mm. And this sounds like a weird grab, but there was a great part, and it's talking about the early arcade games, things like Space Invaders yeah. and Atari Home Systems. And this one of these Japanese gaming engineer guys, he says, sound is confirmation. And that, to me, is a philosophy that I have definitely incorporated and that is my how I know that I need to add a sound effect into a scene is if my words aren't confirming it for the listener, then I need something in there that will. And I've talked about these specific chapters. I think maybe I'm talking about them a lot because they're top of mind because that's what I'm working on right now. Of course. So every chapter, like each chapter for anybody who didn't watch it before, each chapter was two parts in the first season. And I switched up the formatting. So they're all episodic. All the episodes are named now. And that was because I was getting complaints that it was getting confusing. Well, it would have gotten way more because in the second season, every chapter is three episodes. Oh, wow. And this one, which is chapter four, is actually five. So the chapter script was 60 pages long. Wow. So I had to break that down. And this chapter... Big Star Wars fans are fans of Terracossi, Masters of the Terracossi, which is the stupidest Star Wars video game ever made. It's the worst, but it's so like, and people are like, no, the dancing one. And I'm like, no, no, it's worse. Trust me, it's a worse game. Have you played Masters of the Terracossi? Yeah, it's burned. Am I wrong? No, you're not wrong. It is. (laughs) There's a guy who actually uh, does voices on it. He was one of my friends in high school, like right at college. We were in college when we rented it for the PlayStation 1. And he was there that night we rented it. And when I told him I was doing a Terracossi chapter, he goes, oh my God, this is full circle. This is like 1997, come back. Like this is, this is it. We're reliving 1997. This is amazing. So Terracossi kind of, it was mentioned in the Clone Wars series as the Mandalorian martial art to neutralize yeah. Jedi, literally translates into steel hand, and then was never really got much attention ever in the films until Solo, when Amelia Clark yeah. says that she studied Terracossi, and I was like, yes! And so in the series, because it, it moves very fast, like in the first season that is about seven or eight months in the second season over the whole series over the whole season it's about a year but the first four episodes are really only three months and so much is happening and so one thing that my father told me about this on the ships is and they mentioned this in Battlestar Galactica and it's true a dance where they have the the sailors, they can call each other out and they can fight. And it's like, it's not like no holds barred, like cage fighting. It's a boxing match and it gets bad blood out and it builds this esprit de corps and it tightens them up as a unit. And whoever wins gets a title. And in the first world war, they would do this with regiments. They do this with battalions and you'd be the battalion champion. Then you'd fight the next rank and then you fight the next rank. And so you had like, the army champion, you know? And so to incorporate that, because I'm trying to make it as grounded of a story as possible. Mm -hmm. I want to incorporate that into the story. And 
because morale in the 934th Legion, the Iron Star, is so low, the general, General Vasek, and the new Commodore decide, let's put on a show. So we're going to have a Legion-wide Terracosti tournament. And so when you talk that sound is confirmation, I have had about eight people record like punching sounds. like <laughs> So it sounds like people are getting punched. It sounds like people are getting beat up. So that while I'm talking about these fights and I'm saying, and then they dodged, there's like a, they, they took a light shot in the side and you got the punching sound. And then the sound of that character wincing. But then there's characters that are mentioned that aren't really like main characters. So I had to get new voices in to do that too. So I've got like layers and layers of these fighting sounds running over top of atmospheric sounds, crowd sounds, then the overall environmental sounds because some of these fights take place outside, say on the tarmac of a starport. It's almost like a Street Fighter 2-esque setting. And then the, the, the finals take place in this massive arena. Like, so I tried to do that stuff. And, and in the story, it's sort of like this big fight tournament is turned into like a propaganda piece by the Empire to show the locals like how, you know what, we're bruised but not beaten. We get up, we rise again, and they have recruiting stations and all of the fights so that when young dudes that are drinking see the fights happen, they're like, I want to do that. And they sign up. And guess what? You get thrown in the truck. You're off. <laughs> You're done. You belong to us now. So there you go. So that's sort of like the way I wanted to build this as real as possible with as much sound con- confirmation as possible in the series. You mentioned, uh, of course, the the military aspect in, inside of things, like what you said with your uncle and everything like that. And <laughs> no, my dad, my your father. Dad, right, right, so I like, apologize to your dad. Oh, right. good. No, no, no. no. My uncles are pretty cool, too. They were also in the military, but they didn't do it for careers. My dad so, was a lifer. Did did your dad ever listen to that episode three years ago where I made that joke? Which one? It, it was the joke about couldn't make it in the military, so you just made a podcast about it. Ah, no, no, no. <laughs> but he would have he would have agreed with you. Absolutely, he would have agreed with you. I like I tried to get into the military, but I couldn't. I failed the physical, so I couldn't get in because I'm asthmatic. And you can back in those days, you couldn't get in. They made you do this like lung volume test. They test your lung capacity, and my lung capacity wasn't the size to be in the Canadian military, I guess. That's what I was told. Him. I failed the physical, though, otherwise. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I but, tried but the hey, same. You tr- really? Well, I tried for OPP and, and yeah. police, and it it wasn't the – the physical was fine. It was the written that killed me. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, my, my, one of my kids wants to join the Air Cadets, actually, because he's just of age, but he wants to become an astronaut. Is what he, He's a big Chris Hadfield guy, nice. and – He's got the Chris Hadfield kids book, uh, The Darkest Dark. And we we, we, we got to like uh, see him do a spoken word thing. And he talked about how uh, he joined the Air Cadets when he was a kid. And he learned how to fly gliders. And then from there, he that was the beginning for him was flying gliders and giving him the joy of flight. And so that really set him on his path. And so nice. ever since then, my one, one of my kids is like, ah, oh, that's what I want to do. I want to join the Air Cadets. I want to learn how to fly gliders. I'm like, well, let's make it happen. There we go. All right. First step to Mud 79. <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah, you have so much going on in your life here. You have an amazing family and, and you're you're being creative in many different aspects and areas here. Do you take time for yourself? Honestly, I feel like the radio play is taking time for myself. Nice. If that makes any sense. Like it was weird. I used to have no problem just sitting around and doing nothing all the time. I smoke a lot of weed and I used to just sit around and smoke weed and play video games all the time. And there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. If that's what you like to do, like everyone has their own thing. And what happened was, and and I had this roommate and his name was Chad, oddly enough, his name was Chad and Chad was like a a super great guy. Uh, And Chad used to annoy me because he was so active. He was so doing stuff and so positive and so encouraging and so excited about things. And, and God he used to annoy me so much because of that. The great guy, like, but I could recognize that he was a good person and he used to write. And he would be like, I try and write for like half an hour a day. I'm like, well, what are you writing? And then he'd be like, anything. Like, I just I write about my day 
or I try and like, I, I write, if I've got an idea for a story, I write it down. And, and if I write it until I can't write it anymore and I'm like, Oh, that's so exhausting. And then I started doing that. And that's when I did my very first comic. And I feel like ever since then I have this, it's like a guilt if I'm not creating and I saw this in a meme once and I felt like, oh my God, that's me. That's how I view myself. And it, the meme was, it was like this, it was like this four panel comic strip. And it was like this kid, it's like a baby is born and he's in the whole universe resides within them. And this universe is within them just waiting to get out. And he's playing with toys as a kid. And that's the beginning of this universe getting out, this world that he's created within himself getting out and then he becomes older and he thinks that that's stupid that imagination is stupid and he locks those stories in that universe away and then he dies never having let it out because he convinced himself that no one wanted to hear about it and then I remember thinking like that is tragic to me that's that's horrible tragedy I think that there's so many people out there that have the greatest story ever told just sitting in their head and they never bother to get it out. And I'm not saying that the first story you write is going to be the best. And I'm not saying you ever will write the best. I'm just saying that you've got great stories in you that are just dying to get out. You let the difficulty of getting them out, get in the way of it happening. It's true that not every time I sit down to do audio work. I'm in a really motivated headspace to get it done. I just do it and I convince myself to get it done. And the first few episodes were really hard to do because you're at the bottom of the hill. And I knew that it would take about two weeks of production time to get each episode done. It would take about two weeks. And so 20 episodes, that's 40 weeks of having to work for like an hour a day five or six days a week nobody wants to do that man like nobody wants to do that but you just sit down and you do it and eventually now i'm more than halfway done i've done 11 episodes and a lot of the time i sat down to do that production i wasn't super motivated and i think that people have this idea of oh i'm, I'm burning myself out i'm burning myself out and that can happen but I do, and I know this makes me sound like an asshole, and I don't want it to. But a lot of times when people saying they're having burnout, it's not that they're having creative burnout. It's that there's burnout in other parts of their lives that they're letting getting in the way of their creative. And that's different for everybody. I don't want it to make it seem like if you're not doing it, you're lazy and you suck. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying if you really want it you need to try and find a way to make it work it's not easy and it shouldn't be easy like because i'm not saying you need to suffer for it either but there's an episode of comedians and cars getting coffee with uh, jerry seinfeld and i forget who it's with like which comedian is with that he says that he goes if i only went on stage when i felt like it or was in a good mood i'd have done three comedy shows my entire life and it's like that's Jerry Sanchez. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you always talk about like surround yourself with successful people. If you want to be successful, listen to successful people. If you want to be successful, I would wager that Jerry Seinfeld is quite successful. Just that he has achieved a, a few things in his day. Yeah. So if he's like dropping the, that type of wisdom, I'm going to listen, you know, I am not Jerry Seinfeld. So I will listen to Jerry Seinfeld. Is what I'm saying. Definitely. No, I, I love his show. I love I love what he does with that because you, you see different perspectives from different comedians. I love Other... how some of it is like they're riffing. Yeah. And then some of it, they're just telling stories. And, and then it's... others, they're laying down truths about, you know, their, their lives and their jobs, but then they're just jumping right back into something funny. And it's amazing to see. Like I, I watched the Martin Short one. I thought that was just hilarious. Like I yeah. that was... episode with Eddie Murphy yes. is my favorite. Yes. And the Eddie Murphy episode is so great because we forget who Eddie Murphy was. Yes. And it's been so long and he's almost like a recluse. 
you know, and he made all these like goofy bad movies mm -hmm. and he took the money and he ran and all that. He's one of the greatest stand up comedians of all time. Yeah. And it's not up. And this is the thing is like, I feel like, like everything, there's a lot of factionalization. Are you a progressive comedian? Are you a bro -y comedian? Are you a this -a comedian? Everybody on all spectrums loves Eddie Murphy. <laughs> like everybody, yeah. all of them, all of them will say that Delirious is one of the greatest stand up sets mm -hmm. of all time. And he's dressed like an idiot, yeah. but nobody cares because it's so good. Eddie Murphy and Jerry Seinfeld started at the same club the same week. <laughs> Eddie Murphy pulls out a poster of a show they did together where their names are spelled wrong. And it's like, it's, it's wild to yeah. hear the story that those two are talking. We're just ranting about that show. I, I know. I know. It's yeah, great. Yeah, I sorry. Love it, but no, it's fine. I'll, I'll take the segue anytime. Yeah. But what is the season one episode list? Is it like one to eight? What is season? The first season has 12 episodes and I knew I wanted to leave it with a bit of a cliffhanger. Like I knew what the ending that it has. So the first season ends with the main camp getting attacked and you realize that they have severely underestimated the resolve and the resistance and the military capabilities of their enemy on the surface of Sestin four season two, which is episodes 13 to 32. So it's 20 episodes. That season picks up right after. Like it's it's the same scene. Right. It's got the whole Rogue One episode four switch. So the, the final shot of episode 12 is the first shot of 13. Nice. And the voice performer, uh, my buddy Ren, she's got the last line in season one, like episode 12. She's got the last line. And she's got the first line in the next season. And it's great. It just starts out so dire with so much chaos and so much confusion. And I really wanted to show the empire bleeding. You start to learn exactly what happened as things go along. But the thing about that I've, that I've done with the story is I've never been definitive about everything. There's certain things that the character will be like, because this character is writing this as a memoir. When you listen to it, you get a sense that he mentioned several times that he's much older now. I'm not going to give away how old he is or when he's writing it, but it, he talks about the New Republic at certain points, so it should probably be, it's all there. It's all there in the subtext. At this point, you start to get a sense of, he thinks he's got it figured out as the young character, but at no point does the older voice of reason step in to be like, actually what happened was, and I did that on purpose because I don't want you to know what actually happened because the soldiers that are there that are on the front line don't know what's happening at the top. They just have a, that's why they call it the dope. Who's got the dope. What's the dope. What's going on. Who knows? Does that, I got a buddy and he says, and there's a lot of that in the show. And then there's certain points where you'll have the voice of reason, who is the narrator, come in to sort of steer things. But at no point does he ever go, actually, this is exactly what happened. Because even then, he wouldn't really know. And sometimes the narrator comes in to say, my, my perception now is that it was more this, but no one really knows because the people that would know were all killed, you know? So there's a lot of that like cloak and dagger, frontline guy, soldier talking about things. Um, and there's some really great uh, new characters that, are in this season and some characters that weren't major players in the first season that become major players because some of the characters really close to the narrator get killed. Um, and so he starts leaning on other characters and you'll find that they start talking and being involved more. There's three characters that I've sort of brought in and they're often involved in talking amongst themselves. And it's uh, Targon, Altherium, and Tolan. And Targon is a Zeltron. She's Zeltron. She's voiced by Alex Payne. 
And then there's Ethereum, who is human. He is voiced by Jason Lowe. And he's got the designation of being the best detonator thrower in the unit. Like he's got a good arm and they all recognize that that's his trait. And those types of things are what soldiers will remember. Like he was Johnny on the spot with the detonators. Like you needed one in a spot. He could, he could get it in there. He used to play, he used to play Lemmy before he joined and he had a great arm and that's what he does. He put, get a detonator. It's like, 20 meters away he'll get it there in a window if that's what he needs to do and then there's another character tolan who is voiced by one of my former radio co-workers a guy by the name of yukon jack uh, who does mornings at the bear in edmonton and he could have been an amazing voice actor he's so good he does such a great job like he's really into the character <laughs> who is the designated he's the grenadier so he's on the rocket and he's always firing the, the rocket, the RPS-6, which is the portable version of the light rocket launcher used by Imperial forces. I introduce his assistant, his assistant grenadier. He's constantly being an asshole to her to get her on the page. And there's a lot of that in the second season because their numbers are so low that they've got fresh recruits that are joining. And then some of these fresh recruits have voices and, my friend Callie Millman, she is the voice of this assistant grenadier, and her name is Usavi, and she is Keshian. Keshians have great eyesight and a great sense of smell. And this is all from the Wikipedia, by the way. All this stuff is like, I'm not making any of this up. Yeah. There's a lot of points where they're in the bush, and they haven't been able to shower for a while, and she's like, all of you smell terrible. <laughs> you smell awful. And then Tolan will be an asshole to her. Cause she screwed up cause she's not on the page yet. And they'll always talk about like, you might think that we were being an asshole, but you need to get them on the page because fresh gray gets you killed. And that, and that's, that goes back to, I don't know if you watched band of brothers, yeah. but there's that scene right after Bastogne when all the new troopers are in, none of the old guys want to be nice to the young guys because they get them killed. And then You've invested time in getting them ready and then they just died and it's too traumatic. You shut yourself off. And so those types of little psychological things I wanted to have play out in the story. And then once the respect is earned, they're in, you know what I mean? Which is something that legitimately would happen. Exactly. If you prove that you're valuable and you're worthwhile, then you're good. And there's a really cool new scout that joins the scouts of 1579. And her name's Puenda, and she is Twilik. And the voice actress that plays her, Rosalind, uh, who actually works for the, the podcasting network, nice. she just talked. And I was like, oh, my God, I need your voice in the show. So that was that. <laughs> I love it. That's great. Yeah, we, we can go on and on about this here as well, too. I, I love just chatting with you. There's so much that, that we could easily dive into. Before I, I jump into my last couple of questions is there anything that i haven't touched on besides social media and where we can find you you'd like to be asked or like to talk about my thing that i want to like reiterate is i know that when somebody says it's like a fan-made thing people kind of like roll their eyes but there's so many incredible fan-made projects out there and i feel that if this was a video project it would be a viral sensation yeah. like it would be and i think that in terms of like it, its scope and its scale and its production value it's on par with that like anime tie fighter thing, or it's yes. on par with like bucket heads or, which I think is probably one of my favorite fan made star Wars productions out there. Bucket heads is absolutely dynamite. The visual side of storytelling gets like, it's not, I'm not saying it's easier. It's, it's hard. And it, there's so much more money that gets involved in getting the shot and getting the costuming and all that stuff. And I get it. I just, when you've got a visual thing, you can be like, look, and people go, ooh, when you've got an audio thing, you've got to listen to it. It's the same with when you're doing comics. Yeah. When you're writing, here's the story that you need to invest time into reading. When you're an artist, I put my pages in front of you and you go, wow, that's really good. <laughs> you know, you see right away that visual recognition. Whereas with audio, with scripting, you've got to really like take the time and read it and listen to it so yeah i'm just wishing people would give it a chance yes is really what i'm reiterating 
look, you have a fan in me at least. I wouldn't have you back on as many times as you actually have been on, whether it was at a comic convention or through our conversations here, uh, without noticing that you have the talent to do what you do very well. So thank you. I, I love what you're doing. I'm in the same mindset, especially when I had when you have a long format show like say two geeks talking for 15 <laughs> years, where you're struggling to get people to even notice what you accomplish, and yet they only spend an average of two minutes looking at your stuff. Mm-hmm. So absolutely, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I feel your pain. I do. Dude, um, yeah, but it is. It is what it is. We we suffer for our craft, as as it were. So yeah, hundred <laughs> percent, we do. Oh. Were you going to do like a, in case you missed it or a summary of like season one or season two or anything like that? I had planned on doing okay. that. I planned on doing it, but and, cause I initially didn't plan on releasing the first season each week. Dila, our editor producer, she was very like, you know, it's been three years. Yeah. Let's like, if you've remastered it, don't just lose that in one shot, treat it like it's a brand new thing. And she goes, what you're going to do is it's not going to be as intimidating to other people because if a new audience is finding it, that gradual build, she's like consistent, consistent, consistent releases one week after another. That's the way to do it. She goes, and you've got 32 weeks of content. That is, you're going to have a big wave of momentum at the end of it. Don't do one big recap. Don't do one big re-release. Just get it all out. So that's what we're doing. Nice. No, she she's very smart. I'm glad yeah. glad, glad you're listening to her. She's won. She's like won all kinds of awards. So I shut my mouth and listen when she talks. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? In terms of comics, oh, I don't know. Like it, it's it, that's a that's a that's a tough question. I think Adam Gorham, who's one of my best friends, is one of the most inspiring people that I know in the world of comics because he never gave up on his dreams and he is such a fiercely hard worker. He works so hard, improve his craft, and stay true to what he thinks is important. Uh, And there's always that line, draw your way, not their way. Adam draws his way. And I have watched his talent grow for the past 12, 13 years. And it's some of the stuff like that. He did this Galactus Silver Surfer commission that he posted just recently. Oh my God. Oh my God. Is it beautiful? He's so good. And the thing is I've got a, one of his very first pages is no on this side. Right there. That's a vintage Adam Gorham right there. Yeah. You guys were one of the first that I really interviewed back at C- uh, sorry, Fan Expo Canada 2012. So yeah, that was when we were doing, that was when we were wrapping up Teuton. I think that was when we were on the final path, path of Teuton, uh, which was pretty fun to do, but we, yeah, we're, we've got something else that's in the pipes that I can't nice. talk about, nice. cool. uh, but, but it's going to be pretty cool when it does happen. <laughs> and I'd also um, say, even though I, I never met him, uh, Darwin Cook would be inspirational to me. Uh, and I I liked Darwin Cook's art. I did. And I, and I liked the Parker books. And I, I absolutely adored uh, The New Frontier. But if you've got The New Frontier, this is, this is what really made me a Darwin Cook fan. This is what like, made me reread a bunch of his stuff from an entirely new perspective. In, in the back of The New Frontier, there is a letter that he writes about how he stole magic from his younger brother. They were watching this TV show that was like a cable because he grew up in St. Catharines and it was like this cable TV show coming in from Buffalo. (laughs) And the premise of this show was that it was this guy he was broadcasting from outer space all the way back to earth. And his little brother loved this show. His little brother thought that it was real that he was really in outer space. And Darwin Cook goes, this is the only real regret that I have in my life is that I told him that it was fake and that it wasn't in outer space. And he goes, I didn't do it for any reason other than spite. And he goes, and I watched the magic leave. And he goes, and that was the moment in my life when I realized that magic is a very real thing. And the power of belief is unsurpassed. And I stole it. 
And don't do that to anyone ever. Let them love what they love and let them believe what they believe. And I think it is one of the most profound yet simple things that I've ever read in my life. And it is a very tactile, relatable tragedy because every one of us has done that one. And without even, maybe without even realizing we did it, but with a little bit of self-reflection, you can keep yourself from ever being that awful again, you know? That's a really great inspirational thing that I read from someone that I never met, but I was at cons he was at but I was a nobody shilling my little like indie floppy while he's selling like 18 different trade paperbacks that have won multiple Eisners and stuff like that. So I wasn't, I wasn't chumming it up with Darwin cook at that point, you know, spoilers suck. I'm just saying. Yeah. Yeah, they like, do. They do. Don't steal it from somebody, man. Yeah. Let them, ha- let them have what they want to have. Yeah. Don't be an asshole. Basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. From a professional standpoint, you are a multi-talented creative individual from radio host to comic writer to, of course, a amazing Star Wars storyteller in his own right with Mud 79. And I can't wait to see season two and three and everything like that and whatever you do in the future as well. So professionally, you're successful in, in multitudes of creative works. Do you consider yourself personally successful? No. No, not really. I consider myself successful enough. Um, but it's, and it's never like, there's a, like, we'll talk a Canadian band, a Conline Crush, and they sing the song, It's Never Enough. Come on, take it all the way. I feel like that's the way it is. And I was a huge Arnold Schwarzenegger fan growing up. That's somebody else who would be a big inspiration, but that's a whole episode where I'll just talk about Arnold Schwarzenegger. Encyclopedia of Modern Bodybuilding, he talks about the importance of, and he talked about this actually in his his biographies, that series that Netflix just did about him. He goes, when Stradman Hillary climbed Mount Everest, what did he do when he was at the top? He was looking in the distance and he saw another mountain that was really far away. He's like, ah, that's the mountain I got to climb next. And it's like, that's the way that you need to be to avoid stagnance in life. And it's never enough. And there's always another journey to take. And that's not saying don't enjoy what you've got, but it's the idea is like, make sure your feet are always itchy, that you're always on the move, you know, take the time to get there. Like keep slugging it away. Like, like the, the tiniest ax fells the mightiest wood. You know what I mean? Like bud 79 season two is an insurmountable amount of work, but now it's halfway done. You know, so it just it, those little steps just keep going forward. So I don't ever think that I'm I think that I'm successful enough. I would never say I'm unsuccessful. But have I achieved the goals that I've wanted to? Not at all. Not at all. I've, I've never written a Silver Surfer story. I've never written a Conan story. I've never written anything for Marvel or DC. I've never worked on a Highlander reboot. I've never adapted Blackthorn from Blizzard into a movie or comic or anything. And that's an IP that I'd kill to work on. There's, I've never written a video game. I've never worked on an Assassin's Creed game. And those are all things that I want to do. So I'm going to keep going until I get to do all those things. I mean, am I successful? I think I, I guess I am. Am I successful next to Sam Meggs? Dear God, no. Am I successful next to Ed Brisson or Michael Walsh or Vita Ayala? No, 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 not, not in any way. So like, or, or Deborah Chow, like, no, uh, these are all things that I want to do. They are where they're eating at the table I want to eat at. And so my successes are great. My successes are the platform that I will use to get to the next success and the next platform. So I, it's weird. People, when they're like, I'm successful, it's like, great. What are you doing? What's the next? What's next? What's next now? Like the end of Alexander the Great or the movie Alexander, which is a really bad movie. But when he's super sick and he's talking to Hephaestion in the end and he's like saying, we're going to go to Germania next. We're going to go. We're going to go across the Mediterranean to Massalia. We're going to march north from there. And it's just like there was it was never enough for him. And, And I feel like that that's how I look at everything myself. Not that I'm Alexander the Great and going to go conquer anything, but you understand what I'm getting at. Yeah. Well, yeah. you have you have under other industries you want to conquer. I get it. No, mm-hmm. it's 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 that next mountain. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> the reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? What are you going to do, man? <laughs> like, what are you, 
what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? <laughs> like that's the thing is like I've gotten so many rejections. So to put it in perspective, right now I've got uh Dead Romans, which is getting some amazing reviews. It did its first issue didn't get super amazing reviews, but I believed in the story. And I think like it got for, actually no, the first issue got like some really good reviews, some really good, but now the series is going along and, and it's clicked, like it's clicking. And all the reviews that are coming in are really positive about it. That was rejected from four imprints before Image picked it up. You deal with rejection. You take a look. You try and understand it because there's always a lesson to be learned from it. I got a rejection letter from IDW, and they gave me some fantastic reasons why. Now, they didn't give me those reasons off the bat. Uh, they said, you know, it's just not really what we're doing right now. We appreciate it, but no thanks. And so I wrote back and I said, listen, I appreciate that. And I'm not trying to change your mind here. And I'm not trying to tell you that you're wrong for rejecting it. I just am trying to learn what I am doing wrong with a book that is, I think, this well written and this executed. What am I not conveying to you to show you what I think you want to see? And the editor got back to me and she said that we didn't indicate the motivation of the characters. I thought in the opening pages that their motivations and their desires and their wants and their dynamics were very well executed. And they were. The problem was in the pitch document, I didn't explain how that evolves by the end of the story. And so I had to rework the pitch. And then I sent that reworked pitch out and it landed. So don't take a failure as defeat. Like it's a learning experience. It's kind of like, like if you get rejected on a loan application, they're not insulting you. That's a lesson. That's saying you can't afford this. <laughs> like you can't afford this. I took heed and I asked questions and then I learned and I got better and I went back and I did it again. And you're going to learn from failure and you're going to keep learning and you're going to keep struggling forward. And the question is, you know, are you willing to keep going? And are you willing to swallow your pride and be like, yeah, I got rejected. We've heard the story about Dr. Zeus getting rejected like 50 times before Green Eggs and Ham landed. And that worked out pretty well for him, you know? There's so many brilliant stories that just don't catch. Yeah. And maybe they just didn't catch then, but they'll catch later. That's our ideal of failure. What are you going to do? Just keep moving on. It's not going to ruin my life but a lot of people don't ask follow-up questions and i think they they take the rejection at face value they sometimes i think sometimes people get defensive they and they get their and i and i i feel bad for a lot of editors i'm sure that there's a lot of stories that were very close and were very good and they sent a rejection and then they get this scathing email back from somebody who's like you don't understand my art you don't understand what I do. And then they like revert to a bunch of like, what is the cool thing to be a dick about on comics Twitter today? And they thread all that nonsense in it. And then they release some goofy book later. I don't know. It's like, you got to be mature. And I think the thing is, is that I'm a bit older and I work in radio and I came into radio in the nineties when there were still a lot of those like big booming talking voice guys like big, big personalities that never paid for anything. They drove free cars. Nothing. It's not like that at all anymore in case anyone thinks that's what my life is like. <laughs> I drove a 15-year-old hatchback, man. That's not what it's like anymore. Uh, but that's what it was like when I started. And I was not in the position to get any of those free things. <laughs> but I worked with this guy in Winnipeg named Hal Anderson. And he's like a broadcasting legend in Winnipeg. And I owe so much of my career to this man because he took me under his wing and he sort of taught me, this is how you behave. Okay. This is like, this is the etiquette. This is how you deal with clients. This is how you deal with listeners that are getting a little rough. The listeners that are getting a little too familiar. This is how you deal with, because this was in the period where like you go to an event and Molson Canadian would have the Molson Canadian bikini team there and all those types of things. And, and I know that like, when you say that there's this immediate, like, Ugh. but that's because there's people that don't know how to behave in those situations. They buy into it so much. And he always used to tell me, don't be, don't read your press clippings. Don't believe your press clippings, kid. And if I ever started, cause I was like 
21. And when I would start to get a little bit too, too yippy, he didn't tolerate it. And he would put me right in my place right quick. And he would always tell me, all of this can go away. This can all go away. So don't ever take it for granted. And don't ever expect it. And don't ever ask for it. And I think that learning how to behave like that and learning how to deal with things, you know, not always going your way and handling it with a smile on your face. Be like, hey, it's okay. Don't worry about it. That type of uh, life skill, because I think it really is like a life skill. I think that has really helped me get to this point where I am in life and deal with a lot of the rejection that is inevitable in any creative field. So Hal Anderson, thank you. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. And the fact that you have the younger generation with you, with your kids, maybe you're inspiring them in some way, shape or form. Although Chris Hatfield already sounds like he has one in the bag already. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> you can only do so much, I guess. But from a creative perspective, they're looking up to you in some way, shape or form. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Just keep doing, keep creating. I think that, the idea of having a career in the creative fields is very different and it's constantly changing and it's constantly evolving. And I think there's people that make like a daily video on social media and that they ride the algorithm and that can work. And sometimes it's exhausting. And I think it's far more of a full-time job than people think. And it's not just about making a funny video and putting it on the internet. I tell them to keep making things. They make a lot of uh, claymation videos. Nice where they make things out of Lego and then they tell their little goofy stories. They made one today involving a car that one of them built and it crashed into the warden from Minecraft who was made out of Lego. And then he was beating up the car and smashing it and pieces were falling off. And then Mega Man showed up and then Mega Man took out the warden. And I was like, this is great. Solid. And I was like, how long did this take to make, guys? And they're like, two hours. And I was like, that was eight minutes. That's fantastic. What a story. What an incredible tale. (laughs) So I just always tell them to keep creating. That's really all it is. And don't be dicks. We have the big line is make smart decisions. Make smart decisions is the key thing. Yeah. That's good. I like that. That, That's a good piece of advice. (laughs) If your life was a comic book or a movie, what would its title be? And... What would its soundtrack be? Oh, man. That could change by the minute. It could change (laughs) by the day. I want to say it'd be something like Transmetropolitan, but I don't think it would be. It'd be like Superman's friend Jimmy Olsen is what it would be. Uh, And the soundtrack. You know, this is what it would be. This is how it would be. Okay, so have you read Irredeemable? That's like the big boom title that Mark Wade did where what would happen if Superman lost it and became a bad guy? Okay. How would you stop Superman? It's one of my, it's, it's one of the best things that boom ever did. And Mark Wade ever did. And I absolutely love it. It's this character, the Plutonian who is Superman and he's a radio journalist. No, he's not a radio journalist. He's an engineer at a talk radio station in New York. And the Lois Lane character is their big star talk show host. And she exposes him as who he is and because she's hurt and she's mad and it sends him off the deep end because she's just put all these people's lives in danger and for no other reason than to get to the truth. What does the truth mean if you're endangering people's lives by the dozen, you know? So my life would be irredeemable if that had never happened if he never flew off the deep end and i would just be some guy working in that radio station and the soundtrack would be a cross between a whole bunch of al green Mm -hmm. and jesper kid who does a lot of the scores for the assassin's Creed games so that's what it'd be well, Fred, as always, you know, I always love having you on the show. We, we talk forever about everything that you do because you're just so ent- interesting and entertaining. And I love having you back on. It just means that we got to get Adam and yourself back on, you know, have like a round table because it's been far too long since I've had you both on at the same time. Cause I think, fun. yeah, we could, we could arrange that. Okay. Um, that's Some, something that there'll be a good reason to do that in a few months. So we'll hit, hit me up in a few months and we'll make that happen. When um, announcements are happening, we'll make sure you're in the know. Sounds, sounds good. 
Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Before I let you go, Fred, where can we find you? How can we support you? Where is Month79 and anything else you would like to promote? I'm on Twitter at Fearless underscore Fred. I'm also on Blue Sky. Just look for Fred Kennedy. Uh, I'm on Instagram at Fearless underscore Fred as well. And I promote mud there all the time. Uh, Also, it's on uh, the Curious Cast Network. You can find it there too. So yeah, like I'm promoting it all over the place. If you just look up Mud79, the full name of the radio play is Fearless Fred Presents Mud79, a fan-made Star Wars story. So that's the full name. You just call it Mud79 because that's a big deal, like a long title. And it also is important that we say that it's fan-made. It is totally unauthorized. Disney has nothing to do with this. So everybody needs to know that. It's important. Which is why I included it in the lower third there as well. There you go. Thank you. (laughs) And that tiny euro goes to your Curious Cast uh, link as well. Perfect. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking to Course. Find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's T-W-O, not the number two. Totally different website you don't want to go to. Website's going through a revamp, so go to our YouTube channel because that is always updated, which is youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. The podcast is back after 12 or so years. You can find it at twogeekstalking.podbean.com or just for search for Two Geeks Talking or wherever you get your podcasts streaming. And as I yeah. say, every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.